Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Dr. Larry Lake and Dr. Jerry Jensen on small data plus simple model equals big data. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of our audience. And so I'm going to launch a polling question. And the first question is, what is your primary discipline? <coughs> We're starting to get some feedback from our audience now. It looks like we have quite a few in petroleum engineering and geoscience. Those two are neck and neck. We have a few in the other category, a few in petrophysics. It looks like most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close and share the responses. It's a tie between petroleum <laughs> engineers and geoscience at 43% each and 9% other 4% petrophysics. So let me now launch the next polling question. How many years of full-time experience do you have in the oil and gas industry? We have quite a few with over 30 years experience. Quite a few of you are in the 11 to 20 years of experience, still getting some votes. We don't have anyone with less than one year, so this is an experienced group. Okay, it looks like the majority of you have voted, so I'm going to close and share the results. We have 40% with over 30 years experience, 30% uh, in the 11 to 20 years, and the rest distributed among the other categories. And so then I'm going to go to our final questions. How do you rate, relate, I'm sorry, how do you rate your familiarity with Capacitance resistance modeling. We've got a bunch of beginners in this group. Looks like the majority of you chose rank beginner. We're still getting responses. Quite a few of you have read or heard about it, but not used it. Some are in the occasionally used it or applied results. We don't have anyone who's very experienced. Most of you have voted now, so I'm going to close and share the responses. 58% uh, in the rank beginner category. So this is a, a novice group on this topic, which is great since we're just really going to introduce you to it. So I'm going to go ahead and close those results. So uh, before I introduce Drs. Lake and Dr. Jensen, I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted, uh, but you can ask questions during the presentation using the Go to Webinar question feature. We'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation, and you will be anonymous. And so let me go to my slides here. You were seeing some of these slides if you logged on early. Uh, this topic today is small data plus simple model equals big data. And uh, our speakers today include Dr. Larry Lake. He's a professor at UT Austin in the Petroleum and Geosystems Department. Uh, he's certainly well known, uh, co-author of more than 100 papers. He's written some textbooks and uh, had, had quite a few other uh, credentials to add to his resume. Uh, he's been a member of the National Academy of Engineers since 1997. And the course he teaches for SCA is Managing Mature Oil Fields with Capacitance Resistance Modeling. Our second speaker today is Dr. Jerry Jensen. Uh, Jerry is a part-time researcher at the Bureau of Economic Geology associated with UT Austin. He's also uh, been a professor at the University of Calgary, served in faculty positions at Texas A&M and Harriet Watt, also worked for Schlumberger. And he has quite a bit of experience as well in, in this area, is well published, including several books. And he is also teaching 
uh, this course with Larry. So the course that they are teaching together is described here. We're offering it in the live online format in June. So those are half days in the morning time in the United States, uh, but you can certainly participate from anywhere in the world uh, since it's offered virtually. And this is a great class for many people in this audience that are trying to learn more about capacitance resistance modeling. And of course, it's being offered in the live online format, but if you would like to have it offered in-house at your location, go ahead and contact our training department for more information about that. Uh, we have a number of these virtual classes that are being offered in the next few weeks. So check your calendar for, for these uh, talks with Dr. Lee Richards, Dr. Rebella Samuel, Dr. Nathan Meehan, and of course, Drs. Larry Lake and Jerry Jensen. And uh, remember SEA, when you are thinking about not only training, but consulting, uh, projects and studies, and direct hire. So I'm going to give the presentation rights now to Jerry, I'm sorry, to Larry, and uh, let him start the presentation. Can you see hey, me, we can see your slides. Yes, we can. Okay. I can see you. Okay, well, let me try to get some of these things. I'm really uh, happy to see everybody here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is an introductory uh, uh, hour to this uh, uh, type of uh, modeling that, uh, that uh, we have been uh, working on for some time now and in fact how do i get it to go forward soon click there it goes try it okay in fact uh, uh trying to think of a, a catchy name and the uh, the best i could do was uh, everybody has heard of big data these days big data and when we started doing this work and it's been over 10 years now that we started uh, doing research on this uh, I thought we were big data, but then people had advised me that we were not big data, and so I changed it to a small data plus simple model equals big data, which is to say it has the uh, uh, it has the effect of big data if if we do it this way. So here's the hypothesis. Every good academic talk has to have a hypothesis. And that is characteristics of a reservoir can be inferred from analyzing only production and injection data. And there's a little story behind this because this research project actually got started about 15 years ago when I would work uh, part time for a consulting firm in Austin. And more than one time we had clients come in and say they wanted a reservoir study. They wanted a new detailed numerical simulation uh, that I pre presume most of you are familiar with. And we would say, yes, bring it on. So can you show us your seismic data? And we would get a, a blank look. And then how about logs? And they say, yeah, we have fit logs from the 1950s. And then how about cores? And yeah, they're up in a, in a warehouse in, uh, in Tulsa. And so it was the coverage of data on those sort of things was extremely spotty on legacy assets. But the one thing they always had was rate data. And so that's what this is all about, is doing the best you can from rate data. And they always had rate data, sometimes decades or more of rate data. So that's what this is all about. And you might wonder where uh, uh, capacitance resistance phrase come from. Well, back in the 1940s, you can see the paper there in 1962, people actually would build physical electrical circuits schematically shown in the lower left here, consisting of resistors and capacitors. And in the upper right here is an incredible picture that shows uh, a photograph of this electrical circuit. These are, uh, uh, these are resistances and it's basically a, a room full of them here. And they were modeling the, uh, uh, the flow of a fluid in a reservoir. And were I to give you time to look at these figures on the, on the bottom over here, you would say they really did a pretty good job. And I think they were modeling the uh, uh, modeling the uh, the Gwar, Gwar field on this. So in a sense, it's an old idea. Um, 
what is different is that when we say capacitance, we're talking about things related to compressibility. And when we say uh, resistance, we're talking about things re related to permeability and or something that we will call connectivity. So uh, some equations. <clears throat> Uh, on the top left is the continuity equation, and, and unless I say otherwise, uh, and I think in this presentation it will always be uh, total fluid, it says that the total fluid accumulation here is uh, equal to the difference between the injection rate and the production rate, and that, that governs the rate at which the average pressure changes. This is a continuity equation. And like all continuity equations, they have to have a closure relationship. And so we use this semi-steady state closure relationship that relates Q to the average pressure and the flowing well, well pressure here. This equation here is probably the most commonly used uh, equation in, in reservoir engineering in, uh, around the other. And so it's saying here that the changes in, in injection and production rate, the differences, is translated over into this change of, of, of pressure. Those two equations can be combined to form an ordinary differential equation. This is uh, this is a key thing here. Then, in terms of the of the flow rate, that's in terms of given in terms of the injection rate, and that equation with suitable uh, assumptions. And I, I I know we're making a lot of assumptions to get to these equations, but I think uh, it's worth the result. The solution to that equation is down here at the bottom. And so uh, it has three terms. It has basically what the slide calls a primary production term. Uh, it has another term here, which is a response to the uh, injectors. That is I right there. And then it has a third term, which is the bottom hole pressure change, which is the bottom hole pressure change in the producer. Uh, very often on legacy assets, we have no bottom hole pressure change uh, information, so we basically just have to drop that, and that is uh, is uh, what uh, where we focus on the on the connectivity. And the things that are different here are this quantity here, which is the connectivity, and I have this I have this uh, defined in the next slide, and this quant quantity right here, which is the time constant or tau. And so. <clears throat> What we do is, and these are just talking about what they are, is that we define a connectivity or basically the fluid going to a producer from an injector uh, divided by the total fluid from the injector. And, and sometimes this is called gain, but more commonly we'll call it the connectivity. And the second one, the time constant, which is the compressible pore volume, which is the total compressibility times the pore volume over the productivity index. And in essence, kind of like this slide, we've uh, we've changed points of view on reservoir engineering. In the conventional world here, we solve the diffusivity equation here, that pressure as a function of radius and time with permeability and porosity in it. In this world, we basically have integrated this equation in space. And so in place of the pressure, there's an average pressure uh, there's an injection rate and a production rate, and this is a closure relationship. At the very end of this presentation, we'll change this one a little bit here. So we've gone from basically the permeability porosity world to the time constant pore volume world. So it's it's a, it's a little different. So, but what's not different is uh, philosophically how we uh, uh, use it. So. <clears throat> Here's a schematic of the production rate over here. Excuse me, I've hit, hit it too much. Uh, that is showing here as, as a dot. And to make, make it easy, we've gotten a field with just two wells in it. So the green dots here are the production rates, and the blue dots here are the uh, are the injection rates. And and basically we just uh, we just change the parameters, the time constant and the connectivity, until this matches this, like we see here, it is what most people would call history matching. But it's very easy history matching because the model is so simple. And so it can be done on a, uh, on a field basis. It can be done on a well by well basis. Uh, it is basically only limited to the, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the data that you have. 
So that's as an introduction, I'm gonna go back because on this slide, this also represents how we've divided up this presentation. Uh, Jerry's going to talk mostly, as soon as I finish through here, about the connectivity part of it. And I will talk about here about the pore volume here, or basically the effect of pore volume. So I think I'm there. Your turn, Jerry. Okay, thanks, Larry. And I just need to get control now. So I'm going to, uh, as Larry says, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the connectivity element of this, and I'm going to start with a few general comments, and then uh, and then home in on on uh, the connectivity as derived from the capacitance resistance model. So the general question one might ask is, you know, why are we interested in connectivity, and uh, I would point out that that uh, we have ish, uh, a dependence on connectivity that's so pervasive in our daily lives that uh, we take connectivity for granted, except when it uh, when it goes missing. So, for example, um, when we uh, have a cell phone, we we know that we want to uh, we want to be connected. Uh, and we, when we don't have connectivity, then we're frustrated. Um, when we walk into a dark room and we uh, we uh, flip on the lights, uh, then we're assuming that there's connectivity right the way from the um, from the the power station through to our uh, through to our light bulb. And uh, and so it is with. Uh, with uh, the reservoirs, we need reservoir connectivity. So I have uh, just a, a very simple hypothetical example here where I have an injection well in the center, I have a producer on the left and I have a producer on the right. And in this left-hand figure here, um, we have connectivity be, uh, by way of the reservoir from the injector to the producer. So when we uh, inject fluid, we see an economic benefit in terms of enhanced production, and uh, we have injected uh, roughly the right amount of material to uh, to to make that uh, displacement efficient. On the other hand, on the right hand side here, we have the same situation, but now with a barrier between the central injector and the right hand producer. And so when we go about injecting fluid, we not only see no benefit in terms of production on that right-hand producer, but maybe we end up over-injecting uh, into the reservoir and we get uh, early breakthrough and so on uh, because we didn't appreciate uh, this disconnected pathway was present. Now, part of the the challenge of dealing with connectivity is there are so many different names for them. Uh, I've listed a few here and I've organized them according to whether they suggest there's too much connectivity, thief zones, bypassed regions, whether they're fairly neutral in terms of, of whether there's too much, too little, or just right, and too little. So stringers, compartmentalization, uh, one sees uh, a reference to compartmentalization uh, very commonly, and uh, so we need to understand that that's really referring to connectivity. Now, once we know what the connectivity level and distribution is in the reservoir, how can we use that? Well, that's really the the purpose or the goal of of our three-day course, but here I've just listed a few possible uh, things that uh, we can apply our knowledge of connectivity to, including screening, geostatistical realizations, uh, assessing the impact of geological characteristics, and also some activities regarding field management, such as optimizing production, um, risking drilling strategies, and 
assessing the need for remedial measures. Now, okay, so that's that's the sales pitch on connectivity and what it can do for you. Um, how do we measure it? Well, there's there's a variety of methods that uh, appear in the literature that people have used, um, including uh, machine learning oriented um, measures, fluid flow measures. So uh, with about 43% of reservoir engineers uh, listening in, then um, you'll certainly recognize reservoir simulation and perhaps streamline simulation tracer tests and so on. And there are the methods which are based in pressure disturbances, such as interference testing and the capacitance resistance model. Now, the idea behind the, the capacitance resistance model is uh, that no matter how hard one tries, there are invariably changes that take place in injection rates. So here I've plotted the injection rates for about uh, 10 different injector wells in a field. And uh, it's very hard actually to keep a constant injection rate. Now we don't know exactly what the story is behind why these injection rates are changing, but uh, uh, one can surmise perhaps seasonal variations uh, might be affecting injection rates. There might also be changes due to operational considerations. Now, the idea then of the, of the capacitance resistance model is to look at these changing injection rates in the production rate so that uh, we can look for those patterns and identify the level of connectivity between injection wells and the corresponding producer wells. So <clears throat> uh, Larry already uh, covered this in, in some regard, but so let me, just, uh, let me just emphasize here that we have this parameter lambda, which is going to be calculated using the capacitance resistance model and it's going to tell us it's going to give us a measure a value between zero and one which tells us what the influence is of this injection well upon this production well and basically we're imposing a material balance on the system now we also know that um, that what happens at an injection well isn't immediately transmitted to a change in production. Uh, it takes time, and that's why we have to account for the response delays using this parameter tau. So for example, if we have a, a unit amplitude pulse that, uh, that we apply to the uh, injection well, then sometime later, we will see a lambda sized pulse at the producer and that pulse will be pretty uh, well uh, the same shape as the injection pulse if tau is small. If tau is large, then the pulse arrives later and is more smeared out. So this then gives rise to this uh, equation which we call the capacitance resistance model uh, consisting of the sum of three terms there's an injection effect there's a prior production effect and a bottom hole pressure effect all contributing to the predicted flow rate using the uh, this equation now because this is a problem that's similar to electrical networks as, uh, as Larry showed, then we call it the capacitance resistance model. Uh, we have to evaluate the two parameters, lambda and tau, for each injector producer well pair. Now, what I'm showing you here is just one version of the capacitance resistance model. More uh, versions and their, their differences are discussed in the full course. But here is, uh, for example, a production at a well versus uh, time. 
and uh, we have taken the uh, the capacitance resistance model result and tried to make it match the measured production as closely as possible and this is the result that we've gotten so the green line is the actual production uh, the brown line is the model production and you see we we don't get the, the, the capacitance resistance model doesn't get everything perfectly identified, every wiggle and squiggle, but it, it pretty well captures the, uh, the general trend of, of production rate as we see in the measured values. Now we do this across a whole segment of a field or, or the whole field. So for example, here we have uh, six injectors and we have nine producers, and I've shown you some uh, some of the matches we get uh, when we uh, calculate those those uh, optimum values of lambda and tau. And you'll see here, for example, in this particular well, the uh, producer was shut in for some period of time, and typically something like this uh, drives other sorts of connectivity evaluation methods crazy because this shut-in was not caused by injection rate changes but it was caused by human intervention and uh, and that sort of uh, that sort of human intervention or workover or something like that um, can make big problems for connectivity measurements and uh, it, it's a uh, it can make troubles for the capacitance resistance model too, but uh, we do have some resistance to these sorts of behaviors. Now, okay, once we get the uh, values for the lambdas and taus based on the history, the, the water flood history in this case, um, how do we know that the lambdas and taus actually represent what is actually going on in the reservoir in terms of injector producer interactions and here's where we can use a process called uh, cross validation or leave one out or that sort of thing so instead of matching the capacitance model results to the to the measured production for 10 years we just run it for seven years and then given that we know the injection rates and production rates for the last three years then we can run the model forward and see whether we're getting a reasonable match or not and in this case it's pretty good now another way we can test the uh, the lambdas and taus and i'm going to concentrate mostly on the lambdas now and as i said uh, uh, we're concentrating on the connectivity element here we can uh, produce little vector maps uh, using uh, using the lambda values. So here are the uh, the wells, injectors, and producers from a field, and each uh, injector uh, has a line to a producer, and the length of that line is the value of lambda between that injector. And that producer. So, for example, uh, this producer seems to be well connected to this injector over here in the uh, in the southwest. These injectors over here, however, seem to be uh, very poorly connected to the uh, production wells in this area. Now, with a map like this, what we can do is then overlay it with some uh, geological information. In this case, it's a it's a it's an isopack map. Uh, seven meters of of sand here, six meters down to zero at the flank, and uh, we've divided the area up into three dominant fasces, uh, according to the study of Zaitlin and Schultz. And then we can look, for example, at the tidal channel area and see how the connectivity is behaving uh, versus direction. So here's a rose diagram showing us that the predominantly significant connectivity values are oriented in the north-northwest, south-southeast direction. And that turns out to be uh, a very similar orientation to the predominant 
access for these uh, these tidal channels. So let's just kind of collect some thoughts here and 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 uh, give some insights into where we would go with this. Um, now the the capacitance resistance model is is evaluating uh, reservoir connectivity without a geological model. <clears throat> so there's no geological information going into the capacitance resistance model results, and that makes it an ideal source of information then to look for relationships with the geological and the seismic information we have uh, on these reservoirs and helps us then give, uh, gives us insights into what are the geological features that are controlling the interwell connectivity and uh, which ones are do not seem to be sh showing any effect and that can then help us apply our insights into validating reservoir models and uh, assessing injectors uh, poorly performing wells as I showed in that previous example and thereby uh, perhaps uh, deciding to redistribute our injection strategies so that we can improve economics and what we find is that generally speaking in water floods we can improve recoveries from three to something like eight percent when we use CRM results for injection redistribution. Now we have a number of field cases that we've applied the capacitance resistance model uh, and um, as Larry suggested we've been at this this uh, applying this uh, for for uh, over 10 years so you see it whether it's heavy oil conventional oil tide oil conventional or unconventional primary production uh, chances are we have some experience in that regard now I want to just briefly uh, show you one uh, case study that we did in a in a tight oil water flood uh, from Saskatchewan in the Williston Basin. I'm not going to show you the full results. There's not enough time here now, but uh, just to give you some uh, some ideas as to the potential for using capacitance resistance model results. Now, any of you who have worked in the Bakken know it's it's a very complicated geological uh, feature. The middle Bakken has something like uh, one microdarcy to one millidarcy permeability. Uh, fluid flow can be by silts, by pre-existing fractures, uh, reactivated faults, and so on. Uh, for this particular field study, uh, tracer and seismic data were available for parts of the field. I uh, show you here in the lower right uh, the general area of the study and uh, the horizontal wells in red are the ones that were included in the study. And on the left hand side you see some seismic attribute mapping of, of some of the uh, fault locations. But what I want to look at here in this brief example is the acoustic impedance. Now we think the acoustic impedance uh, is going to be related to the presence of porosity in the reservoir in the natural fractures uh, of the middle Bakken. And so just to remind those of you who are, uh, who are a little rusty on your acoustic impedance interpretation, a large acoustic impedance applies, implies generally lower porosity and therefore uh, fewer fractures. So here is a plot of connectivity versus the maximum seismic impedance. So, uh, so what I'm saying here by maximum seismic impedance is I mean in the inner well area we measured uh, the seismic impedance of, of a series of volumes and we're plotting here then the uh, impedance of the maximum, the maximum impedance that we observed in any of those volumes between uh, the two, the injector and the producer uh, under consideration. 
And what we see here is a general trend here of, of uh, we have limited connectivity when the seismic impedance is around 55 or 56,000. But as that maximum impedance decreases, we start to see the connectivity slowly rise. So this makes sense in an engineering uh, perspective because it's not just the average acoustic impedance which is controlling connectivity, it's the, the least porous region which is limiting the connectivity between the injector and producer. So that then suggests that we could use the seismic impedance to guide us on well spacing in yet unexplored parts of the field. So where we have uh, areas where the maximum acoustic impedance is quite high, then we're probably going to have to place our wells closer together than where we have areas where uh, the maximum seismic impedance is, is smaller and therefore we can space these wells out. Now all of this is um, kind of building up to a, a sort of philosophy that, uh, that Larry and I have, uh, have uh, come to share over the years and that it, uh, it concerns the level of sophistication that we need in a model to get the job done that we've got to do. So uh, I'm going to propose then the philosophy of, of parsimony, meaning it's the simplest model that explains the behavior is the best model for our situation. That gives us the least amount of time and pre-processing of data that we need to invest in order to get an answer. So here, for example, here's a notional plot of, of model sophistication versus data demands and pre-processing needs and you see kind of a spectrum here um, from full field simulation here quite flexible but highly data intensive to the simpler methods and so i would put the crm down here with uh, with some of these lower data demand uh, approaches some of you may know this uh, this kind of thinking as occam's razor instead of the model parsimony. Okay, well that finishes my part of the presentation. I'll hand it back to Larry now. Okay, Susan, I don't see it on my screen. Oh, there we go, thank you. And, Well, I need to go forward quite a few slides, Susan. Okay, if you want to just advance through the slides that Jerry just yeah. covered. Okay, yeah. While he's doing that, I'll remind our audience that you're muted today, but we will cover your questions at the end of the presentation. So please type your questions in the chat, the question box. Uh, you will be anonymous. Okay, well, I'm going to finish it up. And I think Jerry said, and uh, I said too also, that we, uh, we as a rule do not have bottom hole pressure measurements, but more and more that is not true. Uh, more modern assets uh, do have bottom hole pressure measurements. And so uh, I'm going to finish up this talk with, uh, uh, with the, uh, the bottom hole pressure measurements and the, and the effect of it. And these, this is a pretty active, active project. So, uh, uh, and, and I should have also said that everything that you see on here is uh, uh, almost without exception is either in a dissertation or a thesis or a report uh, somewhere. So, should you like uh, uh, to follow up on it, uh, please let us know. So, let's talk about the bottom hole pressure effect. So, uh, we'll start with this data set here. This is from the data set uh, contributed by one of our sponsors uh, from a case in the North Sea that has, I think, four producers. And you can see there is production versus time. And this is just raw data. So the green dots here are the bottom hole pressure. 
the pink dots here are the uh, are the rate. And these this sort of raindrop patterns here are caused by I think the periodic uh, shut shut in of of wells and and the changes in the pressure are reflected in the change of the rates. And so the uh, the data or the equations that we showed you do have a bottom hole pressure component in it. And so let's do it with and without bottom hole pressures. So here's a plot of of the rate versus time and the field data are the green plots and the uh, capacitance resistance models with ignoring the bottom hole pressure is here. Uh, that's pretty good. And here's a plot that just shows the predicted rate versus the uh, predicted rate versus the actual rate, which is here. It's not bad, but it's not great. It has a regression coefficient in excess of 0.74, which easily satisfies Lake's law of petrophysics. And if you want to know what that is, please send me an email. But if we do it again with bottom hole pressures, you can see from here that uh, um, that the fits are are much visually much better, and the the plots of excuse me the plots of of data versus fit is incredible. The regression coefficient is excess of uh, 0.9, and when we have this information, it is possible to separate the effects in the time constant. Here it is again: compressibility times pore volume uh, divided by productivity index. And you can separate the effects so that you can make a plot of productivity index versus time, uh, which is here for the three wells. And you can see they're all different. Here's kind of a poor one down here, J1. Here's one that's kind of late coming and erratic and things like that. So you can uh, 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 you can actually see the progress of the wells and, and other people have used this to, to, uh, to schedule work over treatments. I, always want to, to remind this, pressure, pressure is a reservoir engineer's best friend uh, by an old UT professor from many years ago. The second one is, uh, is back into a slide that I showed you earlier, and this is actually incredible. Uh, if you can actually, uh, you can actually apply this if there's no injection. In other words, if there's primary production. So that means that term is gone. And this, the response is all a, a result of the prior response and of the bottom hole pressure. And so here is an application for a, a conventional primary recovery field. This one is in Oman. And it shows the dynamic pore volume up here for the three well field and down here the productivity index. And over here, the, uh, the compressible pore volume for the three wells, the actual pore volume here for the three wells, and then the terminal productivity index. And the, uh, uh, the R squared values were, were very good. And this took, this took basically a morning of, uh, of working to do it. So uh, as Jerry pointed out, there's no geology, but it does give you a, a, a kind of a way to feel good about your geology. And the final thing here, and this is this is work in progress. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, here is the uh, the slide again that shows that uh, that uh, 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 being ignored. But what we found on unconventional reservoirs is that this formula right here just doesn't work. This is basically is for stabilized flow or boundary dominated flow, and for unconventional production, uh, that's usually not true. And so uh, you just have to basically replace that with a more complicated expression. Uh, we send you details if you like. And here's the big picture over here. By the way, and I forgot to say this, you have to have pressure data to do this. Here's a plot of bottom hole pressure versus time for an unconventional oil reservoir. Here is rate. And there's a certain amount of pre-processing going on. And you basically convert the data over to circumstances in which the bottom hole pressure is constant. Uh, and here's the way it should look. This is the so-called unit drawdown rate. And these plots should have, on a log log plot, they should have a straight line portion in here for uh, transient flow and then followed by a real steep, uh, not straight line portion for uh, a boundary dominated flow. 
uh, but it's the same thing. You fit it uh, with the rate time model, and you come up with uh, this uh, this oil rate versus time plot, which has excellent agreement. Uh, 0.94 is the regression coefficient, and the result is here is that there are just basically a rough comparison of uh, estimated ultimate recover, pore volume, and time constant with deconvolution and without uh, deconvolution over here. And the difference in the answers are staggering. Uh, estimated ultimate recovery uh, goes down substantially uh, when we have the bottom hole pressure and everything else changes as you see here. So I'm wrapping up. And I wanted to show you this slide again. Uh, what we've done here is we've moved from the conventional reservoir engineering world of permeability and porosity right here to the CRM world where the permeability is replaced by, replaced by connectivity related to uh, that quantity there. And the porosity is related to, uh, uh, related to the time constant. And these are conclusions that uh, uh, that Jerry showed over, and and all along in this work, we have been concerned about comparisons of this method with other other techniques. And I will say that uh, for the most part, uh, comparison with the uh, uh, the geology, the simulation, the tracers, uh, seismic, uh, all these things right here has been been most satisfactory. So it is a good uh, a good cheap alternative. And then finally, as we look forward. This is a slide I, I borrowed from a colleague of mine named Eric Bickel, who refers to uh, uh, conventional simulation models as a very simil similitude model, one that appears to be true, and models that help you make a decision are cogent models. And he refers to these models here as Humpty Dumpty models, which is to say there are so many pieces that if they fall apart, you have trouble putting them back together. So as we look forward, here are the applications to be covered in the full course. And we've touched on almost all of these things. And right there does, does do a little bit, uh, uh, merit a little bit of discussion. Because all of the in injection we've been talking about in production has been combined oil plus water. And so there must be a way to separate the oil production from the water production. And that's all a part of CRM. And these are all the applications, plus a lot more that can be uh, covered in a, a three-day course. So I think I'm finished. Great. We have some questions. Okay. Uh, for those of you who joined us late, uh, you can pose your questions in the GoToWebinar question feature, and you will be anonymous. So our first question is, because CRM works with a total fluid, does it require mobilities of the oil and the injectant or the water to be similar? No, it uh, it worked. I'm sorry, Jerry, did you want to try that or? No, that's right, because you had, you had touched on that in your last slide. It uh, I mentioned that we cut a lot of corners. And of course, it would be rigorously true if the mobilities were the same. But you know, by the time things get uh, uh, swallowed up by the field and all these different pore volumes and distances and things like that, it just doesn't seem to uh, make a big difference. We've done uh, simulations. I think you've done cases with heavy oil, Jerry, where there were big changes and it still seemed to work out okay. So uh, maybe it's an acceptable approximation. That's right. right. Uh, we've done some, uh, uh, not with ultra heavy oil, not, you know, lower than uh, 10 API, but uh, certainly we've had uh, uh, no problems with uh, with uh, 12, 15, 18 API type uh, systems. So the next question uh, comes from an individual who wrote a research paper several years ago when he was in college predicting water <laughs> breakthrough time for a water flood based on the research available at the time, several decades ago. And can you please comment on how the resistivity compa capacitance models would address that today? So predicting water breakthrough for a water flood. I can, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go Jerry and you can add, okay? Okay. I've, I can almost guess uh, who uh, <laughs> the co-authors <laughs> on the paper, but uh, uh, the, the, the capacitance resistance model establishes connectivity on the basis of pressure transmission. 
So, and pressure tends to flow through a reservoir, transmit through a reservoir faster than fluids do. So I think what that paper had demonstrated was that you can actually do a pretty reasonable job of, of anticipating water breakthrough uh, with, the, with these techniques. Great. Jerry, did you have anything to add? Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's what I would have said if I had uh, gone first. Excellent. Next you can question. go for it next time, Jerry. <laughs> what are the advantages and disadvantages of capacitance resistance modeling versus the widely used Buckley and Leverett method? Well, they're both material balance um, type affairs, um, but uh, I would say Buckley Leverett uh, is, I mean, it's it's based on a on a multi-phase displacement. That's that's why you you use Buckley Leverett, whereas we're we're looking in aggregate at the 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 flow and uh, so we don't uh, uh, you know whether it's oil moving or water moving um, we don't uh, uh, we don't distinguish between the the two situations and and that's why you know one of the the underlying uh, assumptions of the capacitance resistance model um, is we assume it's developed based on a on a unit near unit mobility ratio, but in fact we've we've obviously stretched it uh, to its its uh, limits there and and found it still works reasonably well. So toward the end of the presentation, I mentioned that we had to separate oil from water, and we use a Buckley Leverett type approach to do exactly that. But uh, there was not enough time in a one-hour presentation to go through that. That's a very interesting topic, by the way. And uh, if you encourage me, I will spend another hour talking about that. But I guess I can't do that. Or, can I? or they can just come to the class, right? Or you can come to the class. Yes, yes. Excellent. Here's our next question. How long would it take a capacitance resistance model on a 100-well water flood in the USA? And what would be the cost of doing something like that? Uh, well, yeah. I, I do have an affiliation with a consulting group that does this uh, uh, does this sort of work, but 100 wells is is trivial. Oh, that's probably an overstatement. 100 wells is not difficult. Uh, we've done 1,000 wells, uh, and a 1,000 well uh, run might take an hour and a half or so or two hours of, uh, of computation time, and it's usually on a desktop because, uh, you know, it is a nonlinear regression. So yeah, it's it, it can be done, and I can't uh, quote a, a, a price for doing it. And and that's the runtime. But how long would it take to set it up, approximately? Uh, that's really it. As is true of most of these reservoir engineering studies, the setting it up is uh, is most of the time. And basically, it's just getting all the data in the right format so that uh, uh, the input of the model can read it. And uh, uh, that usually takes most most of the time. Excellent. Yeah, I've. Uh, it it depends on data quality. Uh, I mean, given given their abundance, uh, you know, flow uh, of flow rate data. Um, if you have if you have poor flow rate measurements, you know, you're trying to to spin gold out of straw, and uh, but if you have reasonable data. And, uh, and, and and not kind of just uh, wild allocation factors that that aren't checked regularly. You, know, you might spend a week, you know, cleaning up your data, getting it ready for for uh, for application with the capacitance resistance model. But that's also time that you would you would have uh, done that for a reservoir simulation exercise as well. Thank you. <clears throat> so you've talked a bit about in your examples today about the pair of an injector and a producer. Uh, can you apply this methodology when you have patterns in a water flood? Uh, well, oh, of course. Yes. And most of the time we've done it on patterns of water floods. So yeah, it doesn't. In fact, that's one of the strengths of the method. It doesn't require the well locations. So uh, you just uh, uh, take the results and compare it to the well locations that you know about, and you learn something about the reservoir. 
Excellent. Have you had better results using a variety of minimization algorithms, i.e. Newton-Rapson versus gradient versus other MinLP? Uh, I have a, a current student working on this right now, and and if for complicated problems, uh, maybe a 500 wells or a thousand wells, yeah, there 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 are issues you have to sort of play with it. Uh, but uh, when I do it, I usually do use the solver routine on Excel, and that that runs just fine. So maybe 20 or so wells would would be just uh, just fine on it. Mm. And and the answer is yeah, we we don't see. Uh, uh, any problems with uh, convergence for reasonably sized problems? It uh, for big problems, we we have to baby it a little bit. Yeah, right now we're uh, uh, we uh, we're finding some you know for uh, some hundreds of well type uh, cases, uh, we're finding some uh, convergence problems in in. Uh, in in the system, and uh, uh, but what we have decided is that um, that getting a reasonable guess for the for the initial guess for the for the connectivities is uh, is a useful way to approach that. And so we we use a, uh, a an analytical method called the multi-well productivity index to give us the homogeneous connectivities given the the well locations and uh, uh, and then that gives us our initial guess and we get uh, much much more rapid and ensure convergence excellent next question can we use the method in polymer floods too I think we have done it on polymer floods uh, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what what it was, but we have, we have done it for CO2 floods. So the polymer it changes the mobility of the fluids, uh, and and in a sense it uh, it it seems to work. Now sometimes I'm a little upset about why it does work because the polymer uh, should be changing the sweep efficiencies and things like that. But remember this that's based upon transmission of pressure, uh, which is not usually uh, considered in in uh, thinking about polymer flooding. So it seems to be okay. It works okay for CO2 floods. Uh, so I think it's okay. Yeah, we had uh, we had one uh, uh, heavy oil reservoir. Uh, so by heavy, I mean 18, 20 API, and uh, in uh, a water flood in uh, in Saskatchewan. And uh, they did some uh, some polymer flooding there, and and uh, uh, we didn't find any problem uh, with uh, with uh, with modeling parts of the field where the polymer was uh, was injected. Great. So you mentioned a three to eight percent incremental recovery increase in one of your case studies. Was that a water flood or a gas injection project? Uh, it was a water flood. We've done a lot of cases where we optimize water floods. And and, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to uh, take a little bit of a, a deviation here now. But uh, Jeffrey was uh, Jeffrey Jerry uh, uh, Jerry said three to eight percent incremental recovery, and that's about right. Uh, it it uh, it's just that it boils down to uh, adjusting the uh, injection rates. Sometimes it tells you to shut in some wells that aren't doing any good. And sometimes it tells you that you're losing water outside the, pa the pattern, but uh, three to eight percent is about right. Uh, in the early days of this, we we run into a handful of cases where it didn't predict anything, no, no incremental production at all, and we were discouraged at first. But then I got to thinking, hey, that's about right because there is no magic bullet uh, in in our problems, and it, there should be cases in which it uh, it doesn't work. But in the vast majority of cases, we get uh, an incremental improvement, and sometimes it's enormous, like 25%. Excellent. So I'll give our audience one more chance to submit questions as I read my final remarks. Thanks for attending today's webinar. Later today, you'll receive a link to the recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to more information on managing mature oil fields with capacitance resistance modeling. It's offered in a live online class, six half days, June 21st through 23rd, 28th through 30th, 
in uh, the morning time in central time zones. And I don't see any more questions. So thanks very much to our speakers today, Drs. Larry Lake and Jerry Jensen. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.